Summa Theologica Pars Prima Trinity and Creation by St. Thomas Aquinas. Question 39. Of the persons in relation to the essence. Those things considered which belong to the divine persons absolutely, we next treat of what concerns the person in reference to the essence, to the properties, and to the notional acts, and of the comparison of these with each other. As regards the first of these, there are eight points of inquiry. First, whether the essence in God is the same as the person. Second, whether we should say that the three persons are of one essence. Third, whether essential names should be predicated of the persons in the plural or in the singular. Fourth, whether notional adjectives or verbs or participles can be predicated of the essential names taken in a concrete sense. Fifth, whether the same can be predicated of essential names taken in the abstract. Sixth, whether the names of the persons can be predicated of concrete essential names. Seventh, whether essential attributes can be appropriated to the persons. And eighth, which attributes should be appropriated to each person. First article, whether in God the essence is the same as the person. Objection one. It would seem that in God the essence is not the same as the person. For whenever essence is the same as person or suppositum, there can be only one suppositum of one nature, as is clear in the case of all separate substances. For in those things which are really one and the same, one cannot be multiplied apart from the other. But in God there is one essence and three persons, as is clear from what is above expounded. Therefore essence is not the same as person. Objection 2. Further, simultaneous affirmation and negation of the same things in the same respect cannot be true. But affirmation and negation are true of essence and of person. For person is distinct, whereas essence is not. Therefore person and essence are not the same. Objection 3. Further, nothing can be subject to itself, but person is subject to essence, whence it is called suppositum or hypostasis. Therefore, person is not the same as essence. On the contrary, Augustine says, when we say the person of the Father, we mean nothing else but the substance of the Father. I answer that the truth of this question is quite clear if we consider the divine simplicity. For it was shown above that the divine simplicity requires that in God essence is the same as suppositum, which in intellectual substances is nothing else than person. But a difficulty seems to arise from the fact that while the divine persons are multiplied, the essence nevertheless retains its unity. And because, as Boethius says, relation multiplies the trinity of persons, some have thought that in God, essence and person differ, for as much as they held the relations to be adjacent, considering only in the relations the idea of reference to another and not the relations as realities. But as it was shown above, in creatures, relations are accidental, whereas in God they are the divine essence itself. Thence it follows that in God essence is not really distinct from person, yet that the persons are really distinguished from each other. For person, as above stated, signifies relation as subsisting in the divine nature, but relation as referred to the essence does not differ therefrom really but only in our way of thinking, whereas as referred to an opposite relation, it has a real distinction by virtue of that opposition. Thus there are one essence and three persons. Reply to objection one. There cannot be a distinction of suppositum in creatures by means of relations, but only by essential principles, because in creatures relations are not subsistent. But in God relations are subsistent, so by reason of the opposition between them they distinguish the supposita, and yet the essence is not distinguished, because the relations themselves are not distinguished from each other so far as they are identified with the essence. Reply to objection 2. As essence and person and God differ in our way of thinking, it follows that something can be denied of the one and affirmed of the other, and therefore when we suppose the one we need not suppose the other. Reply to objection 3. Divine things are named by us after the way of created things, as explained above. And since created natures are individualized by matter, which is the subject of the specific nature, it follows that individuals are called subjects, supposita, or hypostases. So the divine persons are named supposita, or hypostases, but not as if there really existed any real supposition or subjection. Second article, whether it must be said that the three persons are of one essence. 
Objection 1. It would seem not right to say that the three persons are of one essence, for Hilary says that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are indeed three by substance, but one in harmony. But the substance of God is his essence, therefore the three persons are not of one essence. Objection 2. Further, nothing is to be affirmed of God except what can be confirmed by the authority of Holy Writ, as appears from Dionysius. Now, Holy Writ never says that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are of one essence. Therefore, this should not be asserted. Objection 3. Further, the divine nature is the same as the divine essence. It suffices, therefore, to say that the three persons are of one nature. Objection 4. Further, it is not usual to say that the person is of the essence, but rather that the essence is of the person. Therefore, it does not seem fitting to say that the three persons are of one essence. Objection 5. Further, Augustine says that we do not say that the three persons are from one essence, lest we should seem to indicate a distinction between the essence and the persons in God. But prepositions which imply transition denote the oblique case. Therefore, it is equally wrong to say that the three persons are of one essence. Objection 6. Further, nothing should be said of God which can be occasion of error. Now to say that the three persons are of one essence or substance furnishes occasion of error, for as Hilary says, one substance predicated of the Father and the Son signifies either one subsistent with two denominations, or one substance divided into two imperfect substances, or a third prior substance taken and assumed by the other two. Therefore it must not be said that the three persons are of one substance. On the contrary, Augustine says that the word Humousian, which the Council of Nicaea adopted against the Arians, means that the three persons are of one essence. I answer that, as above explained, divine things are named by our intellect, not as they really are in themselves, for in that way it knows them not, but in a way that belongs to things created. And as in the objects of the senses whence the intellect derives its knowledge, the nature of the species is made individual by the matter, and thus the nature is as the form, and the individual is the suppositum of the form, so also in God the essence is taken as the form of the three persons according to our mode of signification. Now in creatures we say that every form belongs to that whereof it is the form, as the health and beauty of a man belongs to the man. But we do not say of that which has a form that it belongs to the form, unless some adjective qualifies the form as when we say that woman is of a handsome figure or that this man is of perfect virtue. In like manner, as in God the persons are multiplied and the essence is not multiplied, we speak of one essence and of the three persons and the three persons of the one essence, provided that these genitives be understood as designating the form. Reply to objection one, substance is here taken for the hypostasis, not for the essence. Reply to objection 2. Although we may not find it declared in Holy Writ in so many words that the three persons are of one essence, nevertheless we find it so stated as regards the meaning. For instance, I and the Father are one. And I am in the Father and the Father in me. And there are many other texts of the same import. Reply to objection 3. Because nature designates the principle of action while essence comes from being, Things may be said to be of one nature which agree in some action as all things which give heat, but only those things can be said to be of one essence which have one being. So the divine unity is better described by saying that the three persons are of one essence than by saying they are of one nature. Reply to objection 4. Form, in the absolute sense, is wont to be designated as belonging to that of which it is the form, as we say, the virtue of Peter. On the other hand, the thing having form is not wont to be designated as belonging to the form except when we wish to qualify or designate the form, in which case two genitives are required, one signifying the form, the other signifying the determination of the form, as for instance when we say Peter is of great virtue, or else one genitive must have the force of two, as for instance he is a man of blood, that is, he is a man who sheds much blood. So, because the divine essence signifies a form as regards the person, it may be properly said that the essence is of the person. But we cannot say the converse unless we add some term to designate the essence, as for instance, the Father is a person of the divine essence, or the three persons are of one essence. Reply to Objection 5. The preposition from or out of does not designate the habitude of a formal cause, but rather the habitude of an efficient or material cause, which causes are in all cases distinguished from those things of which they are the causes. For nothing can be its own matter, 
nor its own active principle. Yet a thing may be its own form, as appears in all immaterial things. So when we say three persons of one essence, taking essence as having the habitude of form, we do not mean that essence is different from person, which we should mean if we said three persons from the same essence. Reply to Objection 6. As Hilary says, it would be prejudicial to holy things if we had to do away with them just because some do not think them holy. So if some misunderstand homoousion, what is that to me if I understand it rightly? The oneness of nature does not result from division or from union or from community of possession, but from one nature being proper to both father and son. Third article, whether essential names should be predicated in the singular of the three persons. Objection 1. It would seem that essential names, as the name God, should not be predicated in the singular of the three persons, but in the plural. For as man signifies one that has humanity, so God signifies one that has Godhead. But the three persons are three who have Godhead. Therefore the three persons are three gods. Objection 2. Further, in Genesis, where it is said, In the beginning God created heaven and earth, the Hebrew original has Elohim, which may be rendered gods or judges. And this word is used on account of the plurality of persons. Therefore, the three persons are several gods and not one god. Objection 3. Further, this word thing, when it is said absolutely, seems to belong to substance, but it is predicated of the three persons in the plural. For Augustine says, The things that are the objects of our future glory are the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Therefore, other essential names can be predicated in the plural of the three persons. Objection 4. Further, as this word God signifies a being who has deity, so also this word person signifies a being subsisting in an intellectual nature. But we say there are three persons, so for the same reason we can say there are three gods. On the contrary, it is said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. I answer that some essential names signify the essence after the manner of substantives, while others signify it after the manner of adjectives. Those which signify it as substantives are predicated of the three persons in the singular only and not in the plural. Those which signify the essence as adjectives are predicated of the three persons in the plural. The reason of this is that substantives signify something by way of substance, while adjectives signify something by way of accident, which adheres to a subject. Now, just as substance has existence of itself, so also it has of itself unity or multitude. Wherefore, the singularity or plurality of a substantive name depends upon the form signified by the name. But as accidents have their existence in a subject, so they have unity or plurality from their subject. And therefore, the singularity and plurality of adjectives depends upon their supposita. In creatures, one form does not exist in several supposita, except by unity of order, as the form of an ordered multitude. So if the names signifying such a form are substantives, they are predicated of many in the singular, but otherwise if they are adjectives. For we say that many men are a college, or an army, or a people, but we say that many men are collegians. Now in God, the divine essence is signified by way of a form, as explained above, which indeed is simple and supremely one, as shown above. So, names which signify the divine essence in a substantive manner are predicated of the three persons in the singular and not in the plural. This, then, is the reason why we say that Socrates, Plato, and Cicero are three men, whereas we do not say the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are three gods, but one God. Forasmuch as in the three supposita of human nature there are three humanities, whereas in the three divine persons there is but one divine essence. On the other hand, the names, which signify essence in an adjectival manner, are predicated of the three persons plurally by reason of the plurality of supposita. For we say, there are three existent or three wise beings, or three eternal, uncreated, and immense beings, if these terms are understood in an adjectival sense. But if taken in a substantive sense, we say one uncreated, immense, eternal being, as Athanasius declares. Reply to Objection 1. Though the name God signifies a being having Godhead, nevertheless the mode of signification is different, for the name God is used substantively, whereas having Godhead is used adjectively. Consequently, although there are three having Godhead, it does not follow that there are three gods.
Reply to objection two. Various languages have diverse modes of expression, so as by reason of the plurality of supposita, the Greek said three hypostases, so also in Hebrew, Elohim is in the plural. We, however, do not apply the plural either to God or to substance, lest plurality be referred to the substance. Reply to objection three. This word thing is one of the transcendentals. Whence, so far as it is referred to relation, it is predicated of God in the plural, whereas so far as it is referred to the substance, it is predicated in the singular. So Augustine says, in the passage quoted, that the same trinity is a thing supreme. Reply to objection 4. The form signified by the word person is not essence or nature, but personality. So, as there are three personalities, that is, three personal properties in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, it is predicated of the three, not in the singular, but in the plural. Fourth article, whether the concrete essential names can stand for the person. Objection one. It would seem that the concrete essential names cannot stand for the person, so that we can truly say God begot God, for as the logicians say, a singular term signifies what it stands for. But this name God seems to be a singular term, for it cannot be predicated in the plural, as above explained. Therefore, since it signifies the essence, it stands for the essence and not for the person. Objection 2. Further, a term in the subject is not modified by a term in the predicate as to its signification, but only as to the sense signified in the predicate. But when I say God creates, this name God stands for the essence. So when we say God begot, this term God cannot by reason of the notional predicate stand for person. Objection 3. Further, if this be true, God begot, because the Father generates. For the same reason this is true, God does not beget, because the Son does not beget. Therefore there is God who begets, and there is God who does not beget. And thus it follows that there are two gods. Objection 4. Further, if God begot God, he begot either God, that is himself, or another God. But he did not beget God, that is himself, for as Augustine says, nothing begets itself. Neither did he beget another God, as there is only one God. Therefore it is false to say God begot God. Objection 5. Further, if God begot God, he begot either God who is the Father or God who is not the Father. If God who is the Father, then God the Father was begotten. If God who is not the Father, then there is a God who is not God the Father, which is false. Therefore, it cannot be said that God begot God. On the contrary, in the Creed it is said, God of God. I answer that some have said that this name God and the like properly according to their nature stand for the essence, but by reason of some notional adjunct are made to stand for the person. This apparent opinion apparently arose from considering the divine simplicity, which requires that in God he who possesses and what is possessed be the same. So he who possesses Godhead, which is signified by the name God, is the same as Godhead. But when we consider the proper way of expressing ourselves, the mode of signification must be considered no less than the thing signified. Hence, as this word God signifies the divine essence as in who, him who possesses it, just as the name man signifies humanity in a subject, Others more truly have said that this word God, from its mode of signification, can in its proper sense stand for person, as does the word man. So this word God sometimes stands for the essence, as when we say God creates, because this predicate is attributed to the subject by reason of the form signified, that is, Godhead. But sometimes it stands for the person, either for only one, as when we say God begets, or for two, as when we say God spirates, or for three, as when it is said, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. Reply to objection 1. Although this name God agrees with singular terms as regards the form signified not being multiplied, nevertheless it agrees also with general terms so far as the form signified is to be found in several supposita. So it need not always stand for the essence it signifies. Reply to objection 2. This holds good against those who say that the word God does not naturally stand for person. Reply to objection 3. The word God stands for the person in a different way from that in which this word man does. For since the form signified by this word man, that is humanity, is really divided amongst its different subjects, it stands of itself for the person, even if there is no adjunct determining it to the person, that is, to a distinct subject. The unity or community of the human nature, however, is not a reality, but is only in the consideration of the mind. Hence this term man does not stand for the common nature, unless this is required by some adjunct, as when we say man is a species. 
whereas the form signified by the name God, that is, the divine essence, is really one and common. So of itself it stands for the common nature, but by some adjunct it may be restricted so as to stand for the person. So when we say God generates by reason of the notional act, this name God stands for the person of the Father. But when we say God does not generate, there is no adjunct to determine this name to the person of the Son. And hence the phrase means that generation is repugnant to the divine nature. If, however, something be added belonging to the person of the Son, this proposition, for instance, God begotten does not beget, is true. Consequently, it does not follow that there exists a God generator and a God not generator, unless there be an adjunct pertaining to the persons. As, for instance, if we were to say the Father is God the generator and the Son is God the non generator, and so it does not follow that there are many gods, for the Father and the Son are one God, as was said above. Reply to Objection 4. This is false, the Father begot God, that is, himself, because the word himself, as a reciprocal term, refers to the same suppositum. Nor is this contrary to what Augustine says, that God the Father begot another self, for as much as the word say is either in the ablative case, and then it means he begot another from himself, or it indicates a single relation, and thus points to identity of nature. This is, however, either a figurative or an emphatic way of speaking, so that it would really mean he begot another most like to himself. Likewise also it is false to say he begot another God, because although the Son is another than the Father, as above explained, nevertheless it cannot be said that he is another God, for as much as this adjective another would be understood to apply to the substantive God. And thus the meaning would be that there is a distinction of Godhead. Yet this proposition, he begot another God, is tolerated by some, provided that another be taken as a substantive, and the word God be construed in apposition with it. This, however, is an inexact way of speaking, and to be avoided, for fear of giving occasion to error. Reply to Objection 5. To say, God begot God, who is God the Father, is wrong. Because since the word Father is construed in apposition to God, the word God is restricted to the person of the Father, so that it would mean, He begot God, who is Himself the Father, and then the Father would be spoken of as begotten, which is false. Wherefore, the negative of the proposition is true. He begot God, who is not God the Father. If, however, we understand these words not to be in apposition and require something to be added, then on the contrary, the affirmative proposition is true and the negative is false, so that the meaning would be, He begot God, who is God, who is the Father. Such a rendering, however, appears to be forced, so that it is better to say simply that the affirmative proposition is false and the negative is true. Yet, Prepositivus said that both the negative and affirmative or false, because this relation who in the affirmative proposition can be referred to the suppositum, where in the negative it denotes both the thing signified and the suppositum. Whence in the affirmative the sense is that to be God, the Father, is befitting to the person of the Son, and in the negative sense is that to be God, the Father, is to be removed from the Son's divinity as well as from his personality. This, however, appears to be irrational, since according to the philosopher, what is open to affirmation is open also to negation. Fifth article, whether abstract essential names can stand for the person. Objection 1. It would seem that abstract essential names can stand for the person, so that this proposition is true, essence begets essence. For Augustine says the Father and the Son are one wisdom because they are one essence, and taken singly wisdom is from wisdom as essence from essence. Objection 2. Further, generation or corruption in ourselves implies generation or corruption of what is within us. But the Son is generated. Therefore, since the divine essence is in the Son, it seems that the divine essence is generated. Objection 3. Further, God and the divine essence are the same, as is clear from what is above explained. But as was shown, it is true to say that God begets God. Therefore, this is also true. Essence begets essence. Objection 4. Further, a predicate can stand for that of which it is predicated. But the Father is the divine essence. Therefore, essence can stand for the person of the Father. Thus, the essence begets. Objection 5. Further, the essence is a thing begetting, because the essence is the Father who is begetting. Therefore, if the essence is not begetting, the essence will be a thing begetting and not begetting, which cannot be. And objection 6. Further, Augustine says, the Father is the principle of the whole Godhead. But he is the principle only by begetting or spirating. Therefore, the Father begets or spirates the Godhead. 
On the contrary, Augustine says, nothing begets itself. But if the essence begets the essence, it begets itself only, since nothing exists in God as distinguished from the divine essence. Therefore, the essence does not beget essence. I answer that concerning this, the abbot Joachim erred in asserting that, as we can say God begot God, so we can say essence begot essence, considering that by reason of the divine simplicity, God is nothing else but the divine essence. In this he was wrong. Because if we wish to express ourselves correctly, we must take into account not only the thing which is signified, but also the mode of its signification, as above stated. Now, although God is really the same as Godhead, nevertheless, the mode of signification is not in each case the same. For since this word God signifies the divine essence in him that possesses it, from its mode of signification it can of its own nature stand for person. Thus the things which properly belong to the persons can be predicated of this word God, as for instance we can say God is begotten or is begetter, as above explained. The word essence, however, in its mode of signification cannot stand for person because it signifies the essence as an abstract form. Consequently, what properly belongs to the persons whereby they are distinguished from each other cannot be attributed to the essence, for that would imply distinction in the divine essence in the same way as there exists distinction in the supposita. Reply to objection 1. To express unity of essence and of person, the holy doctors have sometimes expressed themselves with greater emphasis than the strict propriety of terms allows. Whence, instead of enlarging upon such expressions, we should rather explain them. Thus, for instance, abstract names should be explained by concrete names, or even by personal names, as when we find essence from essence, or wisdom from wisdom, we should take the sense to be the Son who is essence and wisdom, is from the Father who is essence and wisdom. Nevertheless, as regards these abstract names, a certain order should be observed, forasmuch as what belongs to action is more nearly allied to the persons, because actions belong to supposita. So nature from nature and wisdom from wisdom are less inexact than essence from essence. Reply to Objection 2. In creatures, the one generated has not the same nature numerically as the generator, but only another nature numerically distinct, which commences to exist in it anew by generation, and ceases to exist by corruption. And so it is generated and corrupted accidentally, whereas God begotten has the same nature numerically as the begetter, so the divine nature in the Son is not begotten either directly or accidentally. Reply to Objection 3. Although God and the divine essence are really the same, Nevertheless, on account of their different mode of signification, we must speak in a different way about each of them. Reply to Objection 4. The divine essence is predicated of the Father by mode of identity, by reason of the divine simplicity. Yet it does not follow that it can stand for the Father, its mode of signification being different. This objection would hold good as regards things which are predicated of another as the universal of a particular. Reply to Objection 5. The difference between substantive and adjectival names consists in this, that the former carry their subject with them, whereas the latter do not, but add the thing signified to the substantive. Whence logicians are wont to say that the substantive is considered in the light of suppositum, whereas the adjective indicates something added to the suppositum. Therefore, substantive personal terms can be predicated of the essence because they are really the same, nor does it follow that a personal property makes a distinct essence, but it belongs to the suppositum implied in the substantive. But notional and personal adjectives cannot be predicated of the essence unless we add some substantive. We cannot say that the essence is begetting, yet we can say that the essence is a thing begetting, or that it is God begetting, if thing and God stand for person, but not if they stand for essence. Consequently, there exists no contradiction in saying that essence is a thing begetting and a thing not begetting, because in the first case thing stands for person, and in the second it stands for the essence. Reply to Objection 6. So far as Godhead is one in several supposita, it agrees in a certain degree with the form of a collective term. So when we say the Father is the principle of the whole Godhead, the term Godhead can be taken for all the persons together, inasmuch as it is the principle in all the divine persons. Nor does it follow that he is his own principle, as one of the people may be called the ruler of the people without being ruler of himself. We may also say that he is the principle of the whole Godhead, not as generating or spirating it, but as communicating it by generation and spiration. Sixth article, whether the persons can be predicated of the essential terms. Objection one. It seems that the persons 
cannot be predicated of the concrete essential names so that we can say for instance god is three persons or god is the trinity for it is false to say man is every man because it cannot be verified as regards any particular subject for neither socrates nor plato nor anyone else is every man in the same way this proposition god is the trinity cannot be verified in any one of the supposita of the divine nature for the father is not the trinity nor is the son nor is the holy ghost so to say god is the trinity is false objection two further the lower is not predicated of the higher except by accidental predication as when i say animal is man for it is accidental to animal to be man but this name god as regards the three persons is as a general term to inferior terms as damascene says therefore it seems that the names of the persons cannot be predicated of this name god except in an accidental sense on the contrary augustine says in his sermon on faith we believe that one god is one divinely named trinity i answer that as above explained although adjectival terms whether personal or notional cannot be predicated of the essence nevertheless substantive terms can be so predicated owing to the real identity of essence and person the divine essence is not only really the same as one person but it is really the same as the three persons whence one person and two and three can be predicated of the essence as if we were to say the essence is the father and the son and the holy ghost and because this word god can of itself stand for the essence as above explained hence as it is true to say the essence is the three persons so likewise it is true to say god is the three persons reply to objection one as above explained this term man can of itself stand for person whereas an adjunct is required for it to stand for the universal human nature so it is false to say man is every man because it cannot be verified of any particular human subject on the contrary this word god can of itself be taken for the divine essence so although to say of any of the supposita of the divine nature god is the trinity is untrue nevertheless it is true of the divine essence this was denied by poritanus because he did not take note of this distinction reply to objection two when we say god or the divine essence is the father the predication is one of identity and not of the lower in regard to a higher species because in god there is no universal and singular hence as this proposition the father is god is of itself true so this proposition god is the father is true of itself and by no means accidentally seventh article whether the essential names should be appropriated to the persons objection one it would seem that the essential names should not be appropriated to the persons for whatever might verge on error in faith should be avoided in the treatment of divine things for as jerome says careless words involve risk of heresy but to appropriate to any one person the names which are common to the three persons may verge on error in faith for it may be supposed either that such belong only to the person to whom they are appropriated or that they belong to him in a fuller degree than the, to the others therefore the essential attribute should not be appropriated to the persons objection two further the essential attributes expressed in the abstract signify by mode of form but one person is not as a form to another since a form is not distinguished in subject from that of which it is the form therefore the essential attributes especially when expressed in the abstract are not to be appropriated to the persons objection three further property is prior to the appropriated for property is included in the idea of the appropriated but the essential attributes in our way of understanding are prior to the persons as what is common is prior to what is proper therefore the essential attributes are not to be appropriated to the persons on the contrary the apostle says christ the power of god and the wisdom of god i answer that for the manifestation of our faith it is fitting that the essential attributes should be appropriated to the persons for although the trinity of persons cannot be proved by demonstration as was above expounded nevertheless it is fitting that it be declared by things which are more known to us now the essential attributes of god are more clear to us from the standpoint of reason than the personal properties because we can derive certain knowledge of the essential attributes from creatures which are sources of knowledge to us such as we cannot obtain regarding the personal properties as was above explained as therefore we make use of the likeness of the trace or image found in creatures for the manifestation of the divine persons so also in the same manner do we make use of the essential attributes and such a manifestation of the divine persons by the use of the essential attributes is called appropriation the divine person can be manifested in two man twofold manner by the essential attributes in one way by similitude and thus the things which belong to the intellect are appropriated to the son 
who proceeds by way of intellect as word in another way by dissimilitude as power is appropriated to the father as augustine says because fathers by reason of old age are sometimes feeble lest anything of the kind be imagined of god reply to objection one the essential attributes are not appropriated to the persons as if they exclusively belong to them but in order to make the persons manifest by way of similitude or dissimilitude as above explained so no error in faith can arise but rather manifestation of the truth reply to objection two if the essential attributes were appropriated to the persons as exclusively belonging to each of them then it would follow that one person would be as a form as regards another which augustine altogether repudiates showing that the father is wise not by wisdom begotten by him as though only the son were wisdom so that the father and the son together only can be called wise but not the father without the son but the son is called the wisdom of the father because he is wisdom from the father who is wisdom for each of them is of himself wisdom and both together are one wisdom whence the father is not wise by the wisdom begotten by him but by the wisdom which is his own essence Reply to Objection 3. Although the essential attribute is in its proper concept prior to person, according to our way of understanding, nevertheless, so far as it is appropriated, there is nothing to prevent the personal property from being prior to that which is appropriated. Thus color is posterior to body considered as body, but is naturally prior to white body considered as white. Eighth article, whether the essential attributes are appropriated to the persons in a fitting manner by the holy doctors. Objection one, it would seem that the essential attributes are appropriated to the persons unfittingly by the holy doctors. For Hilary says, eternity is in the Father, the species in the image, and use is in the gift. In which words he designates three names proper to the persons, the name of the Father, the name image proper to the Son, and the name bounty or gift, which is proper to the Holy Ghost. He also designates three appropriated terms, for he appropriates eternity to the Father, species to the Son, and use to the Holy Ghost. This he does apparently without reason, for eternity imports duration of existence, species the principle of existence, and use belongs to the operation. But essence and operation are not found to be appropriated to any person. Therefore the above terms are not fittingly appropriated to the persons. Objection 2. Further, Augustine says, Unity is in the Father, equality in the Son, and in the Holy Ghost is the concord of equality and unity. This does not, however, seem fitting, because one person does not receive formal denomination from what is appropriated to another. For the Father is not wise by the wisdom begotten as above explained. But as he subjoins, all these three are one by the Father, all are equal by the Son, and all united by the Holy Ghost. The above, therefore, are not fittingly appropriated to the persons. Objection 3. Further, according to Augustine, to the Father is attributed power, to the Son wisdom, and to the Holy Ghost goodness. Nor does this seem fitting, for strength is part of power, whereas strength is found to be appropriated to the Son, according to the text, Christ the strength of God. So it is likewise appropriate to the Holy Ghost, according to the words, strength came out from him and healed all. Therefore, power should not be appropriated to the Father. Objection 4. Likewise, Augustine says, What the Apostle says, from him and by him and in him, is not to be taken in a confused sense. And from him refers to the Father, by him to the Son, and in him to the Holy Ghost. This, however, seems to be incorrectly said, for the words in him seem to imply the relation of final cause, which is first among the causes. Therefore, this relation of cause should be appropriated to the Father, who is the principle from no principle. Objection 5. Likewise, truth is appropriated to the Son, according to John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And likewise, the book of life, according to Psalms, in the beginning of the book it is written of me. For a gloss observes, this, that is, with the Father who is in my head, also this word who is, because on the text of Isaiah, behold, I go to the Gentiles, a gloss adds, the Son speaks, who said to Moses, I am who am. These appear to belong to the Son and are not appropriated. For truth, according to Augustine, is the supreme similitude of the principle without any dissimilitude. So it seems that it properly belongs to the Son who has a principle. Also, the book of life seems proper to the Son as signifying a thing from another, for every book is written by someone. This also, who is, appears to be proper to the Son, because if 
when it was said to moses i am who am the trinity spoke then moses could have said he who is father son and holy ghost and the holy ghost sent me to you so also he could have said further he who is the father and the son and the holy ghost sent me to you pointing out a certain person this however is false because no person is father son and holy ghost therefore it cannot be common to the trinity but is proper to the son i answer that our intellect which is led to the knowledge of god from creatures must consider god according to the mode derived from creatures in considering any creature four points present themselves to us in due order firstly the thing itself taken absolutely is considered as a being secondly it is considered as one thirdly its intrinsic power of operation and causality is considered the fourth point of consideration embraces its relation to its effects hence this fourfold consideration comes to our mind in reference to god according to the first point of consideration whereby we consider god absolutely in his being the appropriation mentioned by hilary applies according to which eternity is appropriated to the father species to the son use to the holy ghost for eternity as meaning a being without a principle as a likeness to the property of the father who is a principle without a principle species or beauty has a likeness to the property of the son for beauty includes three conditions integrity or perfection since those things which are impaired are by the very fact ugly due proportion or harmony and lastly brightness or clarity whence things are called beautiful which have a bright color the first of these has a likeness to the property of the son inasmuch as he as son has in himself truly and perfectly the nature of the father to insinuate this augustine says in his explanation where that is in the son there is supreme and primal life and so forth the second agrees with the son's property inasmuch as he is the express image of the father hence we see that an image is said to be beautiful if it perfectly represents even an ugly thing this is indicated by augustine when he says where there exists wondrous proportion and primal equality and so forth the third agrees with the property of the sun as the word which is the light and splendor of the intellect as damascene says augustine alludes to the same when he says as the perfect word not wanting in anything and so to speak the art of the omnipotent god and so forth use as a likeness to the property of the holy ghost provided the use be taken in a wide sense as including also the sense of to enjoy according as to use is to employ something at the beck of the will and to enjoy means to use joyfully as augustine says so use whereby the father and the son enjoy each other agrees with the property of the holy ghost as love this is what augustine says that love that delectation that felicity or beatitude is called use by him but the use by which we enjoy god is likened to the property of the holy ghost as the gift and augustine points to this when he says in the trinity the holy ghost the sweetness of the begetter and the begotten pours out upon us mere creatures his immense bounty and wealth thus it is clear how eternity species and use are attributed or appropriated to the persons but not essence or operation because being common there is nothing in their concept to liken them to the properties of the person the second consideration of god regards him as one in that view augustine appropriates unity to the father equality to the son concord or union to the holy ghost it is manifest that these three imply unity but in different ways for unity is said absolutely as it does not presuppose anything else and for this reason it is appropriated to the father to whom any other person is not presupposed since he is the principle without principle equality implies unity as regards another for that is equal which has the same quantity as another so equality is appropriated to the son who is the principle from a principle union implies the unity of two and is therefore appropriated to the holy ghost inasmuch as he proceeds from two and from this we can understand what augustine means when he says that the three are one by reason of the father they are equal by reason of the son and are united by reason of the holy ghost for it is clear that we trace a thing back to that in which we find it first just as in this lower world we attribute life to the vegetative soul because therein we find the first trace of life now unity is perceived at once in the person of the father even if by an impossible hypothesis the other persons were removed 
so the other persons derive their unity from the Father. But if the other persons be removed, we do not find equality in the Father, but we find it as soon as we suppose the Son. So all are equal by reason of the Son, not as if the Son were the principle of equality in the Father, but that without the Son equal to the Father, the Father could not be called equal, because His equality is considered firstly in regard to the Son. For that the Holy Ghost is equal to the Father is also from the Son. Likewise, if the Holy Ghost, who is the union of the two, be excluded, we cannot understand the oneness of the union between the Father and the Son. So all are connected by reason of the Holy Ghost, because given the Holy Ghost, we find whence the Father and the Son are said to be united. According to the third consideration, which brings before us the adequate power of God in the sphere of causality, there is said to be a third kind of appropriation of power, wisdom, and goodness. This kind of appropriation is made both by reason of similitude as regards what exists in the divine persons, and by reason of dissimilitude if we consider what is in creatures. For power has the nature of a principle, and so it has a likeness to the heavenly Father, who is the principle of the whole Godhead. But in an earthly father it is wanting sometimes by reason of old age. Wisdom has likeness to the heavenly Son as the word, for a word is nothing but the concept of wisdom. In an earthly son this is sometimes absent by reason of lack of years. Goodness, as the nature and object of love, has likeness to the Holy Ghost, but seems repugnant to the earthly spirit, which often implies a certain violent impulse, according to Isaiah's. The spirit of the strong is as a blast beating on the wall. Strength is appropriated to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, not as denoting the power itself of a thing, but as sometimes used to express that which proceeds from power. For instance, we say that the strong work done by an agent is its strength. According to the fourth consideration, that is, God's relation to his effects, there arises appropriation of the expression from whom, by whom, and in whom. For this preposition from sometimes implies a certain relation of the material cause which has no place in God, and sometimes it expresses the relation of the efficient cause which can be applied to God by reason of his active power. Hence it is appropriated to the Father in the same way as power. The preposition by sometimes designates an intermediate cause. Thus we may say that a smith works by a hammer. Hence the word by is not always appropriated to the Son, but belongs to the Son properly and strictly, according to the text, all things were made by him, not that the Son is an instrument, but as the principle from a principle. Sometimes it designates the habitude of a form by which an agent works. Thus we say that an artificer works by his art. Hence, as wisdom and art are appropriated to the Son, so also is the expression by whom. The preposition in strictly denotes the habitude of one containing. Now God contains things in two ways. In one way by their similitudes, thus things are said to be in God, as existing in his knowledge. In this sense, the expression in him should be appropriated to the Son. In another sense, things are contained in God, forasmuch as he in his goodness preserves and governs them by guiding them to a fitting end. And in this sense, the expression in him is appropriated to the Holy Ghost, as likewise is goodness. Nor need the habitude of the final cause, though the first of causes, be appropriated to the Father, who is the principle without a principle, because the divine persons of whom the Father is the principle do not proceed from him as towards an end, since each of them is the last end, but they proceed by a natural procession, which seems more to belong to the nature of a natural power. Regarding the other points of inquiry, we can say that since truth belongs to the intellect, as stated above, it is appropriated to the Son, without, however, being a property of His. For truth can be considered as existing in the thought or in the thing itself. Hence, as intellect and thing in their essential meaning are referred to the essence and not to the persons, so the same is to be said of truth. The definition quoted from Augustine belongs to truth as appropriated to the Son. The book of life directly means knowledge, but indirectly it means life, for as above explained, it is God's knowledge regarding those who are to possess eternal life. Consequently, it is appropriated to the Son, although life is appropriated to the Holy Ghost as implying a certain kind of interior movement, agreeing in that sense with the property of the Holy Ghost as love. 
to be written by another is not of the essence of a book considered as such but this belongs to it only as a work produced so this does not imply origin nor is it personal but an appropriation to a person the expression who is is appropriated to the person of the son not by reason of itself but by reason of an adjunct inasmuch as in god's word to moses was prefigured the delivery of the human race accomplished by the son yet forasmuch as the word who is taken in a relative sense it may sometimes relate to the person of the son and in that sense it would be taken personally as for instance we were to say the son is the begotten who is inasmuch as god begotten is personal but taken indefinitely it is an essential term and although the pronoun this seems grammatically to point to a particular person nevertheless everything that we can point to can be grammatically treated as a person although in its own nature it is not a person as we may say this stone and this ass so speaking in a grammatical sense so far as the word god signifies and stands for the divine essence the latter may be designated by the pronoun this according to exodus this is my god and i will glorify him the end of question 39.